If you take your copy of scripture and turn to the book of Hebrews, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 2. And last week we began our Christmas series, The Word Became Flesh. And this week we're going to continue that. And I just want to start with one of my favorite verses in scripture, Romans 5.8. But God demonstrated his love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And one of the words that I like to key on in that verse is demonstrate. God didn't say that he loved us. God didn't send people to tell us that he loved us. God demonstrated that he loved us. And the demonstration of his love is that he did something that nobody could think of or even imagine. The word became flesh. God dwelt among us. And today we're going to spend some time and we're really going to think about and look at what does it mean for Jesus, God himself, to take on human flesh. Why is it important? What does it mean for us? How does it help us? And that's where we land here today in Hebrews chapter 2. So I want you to start with me in Hebrews chapter 2 and we're going to start in verse 1. For this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard so that we do not drift away from it. For if the words spoken through angels proved unalterable and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was at the first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard, God also testifying with them both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. For he did not subject to angels the world to come, concerning which we are now speaking. But one has testified somewhere saying, what is man that you remember him? Or the son of man that you're concerned about him? You've made him for a little while lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor and have appointed him over the works of your hands. You've put all things in subjection under his feet. For in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. But now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. But we do see Jesus. But we do see Jesus who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. It was fitting for him, for whom are all things and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through suffering. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all from one father, for which reason he's not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will proclaim your name to the brethren in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise, and again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children from whom God has given me. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same. That through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all of their lives. For assuredly he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendants of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted... In that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. One of the most beautiful and powerful passages about God demonstrating his love for us in Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to see something here, and I love this, how it starts. It says that we must pay close attention to what we're hearing and not drift away from it. Look at what he says in verse 1. For this reason, we must pay close attention to what we've heard so that we do not drift away from it. And I think that is one of the things that we struggle with as Christians because we hear the Christmas story all the time and we think we know it. And so we drift from it. We don't pay close attention when we're talking about the baby in the manger and we're talking about God demonstrating his love. We say, yeah, we know, we know, we know. And then when times get tough and things get dark, what do we say? God, where are you? God, what are you doing And the writer of Hebrews says, listen, if you would pay close attention, you would not drift away from the things that God's told you. And that's what I want to hammer in today. Pay close attention. 
Don't drift away from the powerful message that the word became flesh, that Jesus, God himself, came to live a sinless and perfect life on our behalf. Pay attention. It's almost as if the writer is saying, and I don't know if you've done this with your kids, but there are times in my kids' lives when I need to get their attention. And so I kind of get and cup their face and say, okay, come close. In fact, what I tell them is you need to come to my face. And they understand that, that it's, we need to talk. It's time to pay attention. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, listen, you need to come to my face. You need to pay close attention to what we're saying because here's the first thing. He says, do not neglect so great a salvation. Do not neglect it. Verse two, he says, for if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? And I think one of the difficult things that we have, there are those of us who come here every week who've never bowed our knee to Jesus. We love being in the family of God. We love the blessings of God, but we're neglecting the gift that God has given us in Christ. I'll let you in a little secret. God doesn't want you to come here to worship. God doesn't want you to come here and sing songs. God doesn't want you to come here looking nice. What God wants is when you hear the word is to respond to his son. That's what he wants. God wants you not to neglect the gift that he's given you in Jesus called salvation. Don't want you to neglect it. But then there are those of us who come week after week and time after time and we just seem to drift. We just seem to drift through our life and we seem to drift further from God. And here's what he's saying. You can neglect your salvation in the same way. It doesn't become important to us. It's not the thing that makes us who we are. It's not the central aspect of everything in our life. It's just the thing that we do. And so we drift. Listen, the opposite ends of the spectrum of neglecting salvation is never coming and being apathetic. Never coming and being apathetic. See, what he's saying here is, the ultimate price has been paid for you to be right with God. You can't neglect it. We get angry. We get hurt when we spend lots of time and energy and money preparing a present for someone and then we give it to them and they stick it on a shelf somewhere, don't we? You ever had that Christmas morning experience where your kids rip into their presents and that one present that you thought was going to just blow their mind, they don't even do anything with it? When Cameron was about six years old, he's really into Legos, and we went around everywhere to find a Lego table because he needed a Lego table to build his Legos on. And I hunted and hunted and hunted and hunted, and finally we found it. I drove 45 minutes away to go get it, and we were so excited for him to have it, and guess what? He never used it. He would put all of his boxes on the Lego table, but he never used the Lego table. And I'm going to say, I was irrationally angry about that several times. <laughs> but here's the point. God is saying, listen, the ultimate price has been paid for you. Don't neglect it. Don't ignore it. Don't take it for granted. He says, listen, I want you to pay attention. And I don't want you to drift because God loves you, God cares about you, and God is concerned for you. You say, where do you get that from? Well, he quotes Psalm chapter 8 uh, down here starting in verse 6. And this is kind of a double thing. He's pulling from something in Psalm 8 to apply it to Jesus. But I want to look at this for just a second. There's a question that's posed in Psalm 8, and it starts here in verse 6. And here's the question. This is the psalmist to God. What is man that you remember him? Or the son of man that you're concerned about him? Have you ever wondered those questions? I sure have. I have moments where I look to God and say, God, why do you care about me? God, why do you think about me? Why are you concerned about me? And it's because that's who he is. God loves us. God is concerned about us. God cares about us. And there is no other God like this. 
I would challenge you to search and look at all of the histories and all the mythologies and all the other religions. In fact, if you look at this, here's the thing. Humanity and all those other religions is an afterthought to that God. We are God's unique, special, wonderful creation. The Bible tells us that when God created us, he created us in his image. Remember that? You've heard that before. That God, when he created us, he created us in his image. We bear the fingerprints of God. He molded us. He crafted us. He shapes us. Psalm 139 says, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. God says, I knew you in the womb because I formed you in the womb. We are the only thing in creation that God blew his breath on to give us life. So why does God love us? Why does God care about us? Because he cares about his creation. He's an artist. God spared no time. He spared no expense when he created us. It was different. Everything else he spoke into his existence, we are the only thing he put his hands on. Now Cameron's going to get mad at me because I'm going to mention him again, but here we go anyway. One of the things I love about Cameron, my son, is that he's an artist. Now he wouldn't tell you that, and uh, he doesn't like a lot of his art because he's a perfectionist. He takes care. He takes time, and he draws everything exactly the way he wants it to be, and it's got to be just so, and it's got to be just this way. And, and, and I watch him, and I'm blown away by that. But I love the finished product when he's able to turn this thing, and he, and he just, the, the just joy on his face. Look, look, here it is. God's the same way. God took time. And he took special attention and he took special care to create us. And he sets us out on the world to display and say, see, look, look, look at these people. So why does God care? God cares because he created us. God cares because he loves us. And God cares because he's concerned about us. And then we need to pay very special attention and not drift away from this. That God is in control of all things in our lives, even when we don't feel it or can't see it. God is in control of all things in our lives, even when we don't feel it and we can't see it. Now, there's this kind of confusing kind of thing at the end of this thing where he talks about Jesus being made lower than the angels. And I want you to look at it with me in verse 8. For in subjecting all things to Jesus, he left nothing that is not subject to him. But now we do not yet see all things subjected to him, but we do see Jesus. Here's the point that he's making. Jesus took on flesh to step into our reality and take control of the world that's gone out of control. And he doesn't do it like a general. He doesn't do it like an invading conqueror. He does it. He comes inside and he becomes just like us and he dies for the world to take control over it. And God says, listen, everything that hurts you, everything that causes you fear, everything that causes you pain, it's under Jesus' feet. He has absolute control over it. But the reality is, here's what we say, we don't see it, though. There's still lying. There's still murder. There's still death and sickness and pain. And God says, that's okay. But you can see Jesus. Jesus is the hope and the promise of something new. Jesus is the guarantee that something better is coming. Jesus is the one who makes all things new. And we never should drift away from that. He says, listen, I want you to pay close attention because this world is broken In this world, you're going to have trouble. In this world, you're going to have pain. In this world, you're going to face difficult situations and circumstances. In this world, you're going to deal with sin in your life and the life of other people. And it's going to be tough. It's going to be difficult. And it's going to be like a burden sometimes. But that's when we need to remember and pay close attention and not drift away from the fact that Jesus is in control of all of these things. And we can trust him. In just a minute, we're going to hear that Jesus has conquered death. Jesus has conquered the full and final enemy that we have. And if he's conquered that, he's conquered everything else. So pay attention. 
But I love this. He says, but we see Jesus. And the question really today is, do we see Jesus? Do, do we see Jesus in our life? Do we see Jesus in our pain? Do we see Jesus in our questions and our doubts and our fears? Do we see Jesus when we sin? Do we see Jesus when we're hurting or we're trying to comfort someone else? Do we see him? Because if we don't, we're gonna drift. We're gonna give in to those fears. We're gonna give in to that pain. We're gonna struggle with victory over our sin. And so the writer says, we must pay attention to Jesus. You know, people always ask me, you know, what are you preaching on this Sunday? And, and me just being contrary to the way I am, I always say Jesus, <laughs> you know. But that's the truth. We need to pay close attention to Jesus. I don't, I don't know about you, but the story of Jesus doesn't get old for me. I really don't get tired of hearing about his love and his grace and his compassion and his mercy. I don't get tired of hearing about him showing up on the scene and angels praising God's peace on earth and goodwill to men. I really don't get tired of hearing about how he loved people who nobody else loved. I really don't get tired of hearing about how he died on the cross to pay for my sin and for your sin and all sin. I really don't get tired of hearing about the day that he walked out of the grave alive under his own power. I don't get tired of hearing that. But sometimes we do, right? Oh, I've heard that before. Listen, if you can say about the message of Jesus, I've heard that before. I don't think you've ever really heard it. We need to pay close attention to Jesus. And here's some things that we need to pay attention to. Verse 9, but we do see him. We see Jesus who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Jump down to verse 14. I want you to see this again. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same. I want you to grab this, and we're going to talk about this on another Sunday, but here, I want you to grab hold of this. Jesus was made low. Jesus was made low. And, and the word that we hear a lot of times, and you've heard in the Christmas hymns, is that Jesus condescended. Now, that's not a good word, isn't it? We don't like people who are condescending. Well, it's not the definition that we're talking about. The condescension that they're talking about with Jesus is that he comes down to our level. It's a very beautiful picture. You know, one of the things I learned early on when I was working in children's ministry is I'm bigger than kids. And you're thinking, you should have known that already. <laughs> Hang on. But I learned that if I didn't get down on their level, I would scare them to death. And so when I was trying to communicate something that may have been tender and loving because I tower over them, it scares them. And it was an amazing reality that I had, an amazing kind of epiphany that I would get down on my knee and I'd kind of get eye level with the kids and I could start talking to them and I would have their attention. And then all of a sudden, it's like I wasn't scary anymore. I want you to think about this. This is what you need to see about Jesus. Jesus gets down on his knee to come eye level with us to get our attention. And not just to get our attention. It's an act of kindness. Jesus doesn't want to intimidate us. Jesus doesn't want to threaten us. Jesus doesn't want to approach us in a way that causes us to not come to him. He gets down. And he opens his arms. And he says, come. I read something the other day that really, I think, applied to this really well. I'm, I'm excited about seeing the new Mr. Rogers movie. I don't know if you've seen that yet. You know, Mr. Rogers was somebody I grew up with, and I loved the guy. Now, I read this article by a journalist who had introduced her children, her, they're young right now, to Mr. Rogers. They'd never seen him before. And they fell in love with him. And the little girl said one day, she came home, and she was having a really bad day. And, and the mom said, what can I do for you? How can I help you? And she says, I want you to put on your friend for me. So who are you talking about? She said, your friend Fred. And she's like, well, why do you like him? She said, he loves kids. And she said, how do you know? 
She said, we can always tell when adults love kids. Listen, Jesus came low. He didn't have to, but he did. Jesus came low as an act of kindness to say, listen, I love you. I'm here for you. I'm open to you. Why? Why why does he do this? Well, all throughout this passage and all throughout the Bible, we're told the reason why. It's because we're suffering. It says in here several times he came because he wants to give aid to those who are suffering. He came because we are suffering. He came because we're fearful. He came because it was fitting. Listen to what it says in verse 10. Why was he made low? It was fitting for Jesus. Now, we're going to get this back from what we learned last week. For whom all are all things and through whom are all things. Basically, it's what it's saying is this. It was fitting for the one who created all things for himself and by his glory to do this. It was fitting for him to come low. Why? So that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Did you catch that? It was fitting for him to do this so that he would taste death. It was fitting so that he could suffer. It says that it was fitting for him to do this, verse 10, to perfect the author of their salvation through suffering. Now, this is what this is not saying. It's not saying Jesus wasn't perfect. It wasn't saying that he didn't have everything that he needed. Here's what it's saying. It was fitting, it was right for God to do this because there's one thing to know what suffering is about. Like we can understand, yes, you're suffering, I understand that. It's a whole different idea to experience suffering yourself and then say, I know what suffering is about. And I want you to grab this for just a second, okay? It was fitting, it was right for God to step into our suffering and suffer so that he could bring help, so he could end fear. It was fitting, it was right for God to step into our reality and taste death for everyone. It was right. Why? So he could be a faithful and merciful high priest. He could give aid when we're struggling. He can give aid when we're tempted. He can give aid when we're fearful. We need to pay attention to Jesus. We need to pay attention that he was made like us. And no one understands you better than Jesus does. He was made like us. Verse 14, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself partook of the same that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Now we've become so comfortable with the Christmas story. Sometimes we get home blind to it and we think, oh yeah, I know this perfect little baby Jesus was born to the perfect parents in the perfect way. You've missed the whole thing. Jesus was born into a family much like ours. Jesus, his family was dysfunctional at best. I had a professor that used to say, when you got family, you got problems. And God's people said, amen. Amen. Now, I would encourage you to go home and do some homework, and your homework is Matthew chapter one, and here's the homework. Go through and read all of the people in Jesus' family tree. Now, names may not jump out at you, but you can Google them or look them up, and it's easy. But here's the thing you're going to find in Jesus' family tree. You're going to find murderers, rapists, people who slaughtered children, prostitutes, outcasts, scum. You know, people that we don't want to talk about in our family tree, right? We all have those people that we wish nobody knew anything about. Now, I never knew this person in my family tree. He was my dad's great, great uncle. And um, we were lucky enough in my hometown to have one of the first 
airplane uh, mail deliveries. Kind of after they were kind of phasing out the Western Union, they tried airplanes. And so my however many greats that is, my great, great uncle decided that, you know, it would probably be easier to rob the plane than it would to be a rob guy on horseback. So the plane lands and he runs up with a knife to rob a plane. And the problem is the guys on the plane had Tommy guns. I'll let you figure out how that one worked out. But we all have those people, right? Jesus does too. Jesus was not born to a perfect family. Jesus did not experience the perfect, wonderful birth. He was misunderstood. He was hated. He was talked about. Think about this. All of his life, he had to hear the stories about who his real father was. Everybody knew Joseph wasn't his father. And so they made up lots of stories about who his real father was. In fact, in John chapter 8, Jesus is in his full ministry. He's getting ready to go to the cross. In John chapter 8, the Pharisees said, at least we know who our father is. Still haunting him. Still there. And how bad does it get when your own family thinks you're crazy and they decide, hey, we're going to come get you because you're gone Fruit Loops. Jesus is teaching and preaching and his family shows up and everybody says, hey, your family's outside. They've come to get you. This wasn't like a scheduled pickup after a play date. They, they weren't coming to take him home. They were worried about him. Jesus, it's time for you to come home. He understands. He watched people he loved ruin their lives. As he walked around and he saw all the people that he created and he just watched how they were living their life and the things that they were doing and the consequences of the choices that they were making, it broke his heart. How many times do we see him weeping over his people and saying, how long, how long I've wanted to hold you, how long I've wanted to comfort you, but you won't let me. Jesus was tempted Jesus was tempted in every way that we are tempted, and he suffers in every way that we've suffered, yet without sin. And I want to I just tell you the dumb thing that I said one time when the first time I began to understand this. Well, then he really doesn't understand temptation if he never failed. He didn't really understand it. And I had a professor laugh in my face when I said that. And he's gonna, I'm going to tell you what he told me. Who do you think understands temptation better? The person who gives in at the drop of the hat or the person who resists it all the way through to the point of shedding blood? Hebrews chapter 12, it says that Jesus resisted sin to the point of shedding blood. And you gotta think about where that comes from. In the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is resisting temptation to to, 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 to find our salvation in a different way to the point that he sweat drops of blood. Now, I sweat a lot, but I've never done that. I've never resisted sin in that way. Really, the reality of my life is sin comes in, I say no twice, and then I give in. Listen, if there's anyone that understands what you're going through, if there's anyone that can help you in the situation that you're in, it's Jesus, because he's been tempted in every way that we have, and he never gave in. He didn't give in. We need to pay attention. We need to pay attention to the fact that Jesus is our help. In verse 9, it says that he tasted death for everyone. Jesus is our help. He is the answer to to the greatest problem and need that we have. It was fitting, it was fitting that he came to die so that he might taste death for everyone. Listen, I, I, I'm, I'm never not amazed when I listen to this. I, I can't imagine tasting death for myself. And I've stood at too many gravesides, I've watched and been at too many bedsides when people have passed from this life into eternity. And it's horrible. But I can't imagine tasting death 
for everyone. I really think that that's what he was fighting. That's what he was struggling with in the garden is the reality that there was a point that was going to come that he was going to literally taste death for every person who has lived, is living, or will live. That he was going to have to drink the cup of God's wrath against all sin. But he did it. He tasted death for everyone so that we never have to taste it. Thursday night, I participated in a memorial service of sorts. Uh, One of our funeral homes here in town does this every year. They invite families back who've lost loved ones and we go through the service and try to offer hope to them. And I'm gonna tell you some of the things that I told them that night, that Jesus has swallowed up death. And that if we believe in him, even though our body may die, we will be alive in his presence forever. And we we go from this life into real life. And there were many that night that came up to me and said, yes, I have that hope. My loved one had that hope. The scariest and saddest thing that I saw is as we were leaving that night, there were people standing out front and they were just kind of shuffling really slow as they were going out. They were just shuffling along with their loved ones and it was really silent and it was really somber and it was really weird. And in that moment I felt they have no hope. They have have nothing to help them go through the rest of their lives. It's like, how are we gonna figure this out? What are we gonna do? How are we gonna live? He tasted death for everyone so that everyone doesn't have to taste death. I love this. In verse 14, that through his death, he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil. He's our help because he renders powerless the one who tries to wield power over us in our lives. Now, I want to be very clear here. The devil is not in control of death. He pretends like he is. He uses the fear of death as a sledgehammer against us. He uses it as this dark cloud over our life, and he's constantly reminding us of our death. And then Christmas happens. God becomes flesh, and he lives a sinless and perfect life, and he's walking toward the cross. The shadow of the cross is always over his life, and there's a moment where Jesus is hanging on the cross, and he's about to die, and I really believe that Satan thinks, this is it. This is it. I have won. I am killing life itself. And Jesus dies, and the world goes dark, and the world grows cold, until Easter Sunday morning. Until Easter Sunday morning when he walks out of the grave alive in power and in glory and in honor and he walks with the keys of death and hell in his hands. It is over. It is finished. He's alive. In that moment, Satan saw his defeat. His power has been taken He's been overthrown because the king of life is not dead. He's alive. And he does that for all of us. Verse 15 says that he might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all of their lives. He is our help because he frees us from slavery. So the devil wields this power of fear of death because we know that if we die, that we go into judgment, we're gonna have to answer for our lives and we're afraid of that. And so we live in slavery to our sin. And Jesus just doesn't conquer death. He doesn't just conquer hell. He doesn't just conquer the devil. No, Jesus forgives sin. And one of the great passages of the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, it says, The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks to God who gives us victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Listen to what he does. He frees us from slavery. He sets us free from our sin. Jesus takes our sin on his account, and he wipes ours clean, and he sets us free. 
And not only does he do it that one time, but every time that we come to him in faith and we repent of our sins and confess our sins, he washes us clean. That's the victory that we get to have. He's our help. We need to pay attention and not drift that Jesus is faithful and merciful. He is faithful and merciful. Verse 17, he had to be made like his brothers in all things so he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Did you get that? He had to do this to be faithful. He had to do this to be merciful. And so here it is. He is faithful to fight for us even when we're not fighting for ourselves. He's faithful to fight for us even when we're not fighting for ourselves. He is faithful and merciful to minister to us. He is the one who prays for us. He is the one who stands between us and God as our, as our minister and he prays for us and he offers forgiveness to us and he offers guidance to us and he offers access to God. Robert Murray McShane, a great Scottish preacher, once said, how would it change your life to know that Jesus was in the next room praying for you? Would you be afraid of as many things as you are? And the answer is no. Would you carry around as much baggage as you do? No. Would you worry and, and not be bold to live for him? No. Why? Well, Jesus is in the next room praying for me. Well, listen, he may not be in the next room, but he's in the throne room of God standing next to his father praying for you. Why does location matter? Here's the hope that you have, the faithful, merciful, loving, kind, compassionate God who put on flesh to take on your sin and to taste death for you is praying for you right now. He's praying for you. And he's merciful. He will never turn us away. He will never turn us away. We need to pay attention that he gives us aid. Verse 18, since he himself was tempted and that which he has suffered, he's come to the aid of those who are tempted. We need to pay attention and not drift away from the fact that when we find ourselves in trouble or we find ourselves fearful, we find ourselves struggling, Christ is the one that we need to look to and not run from because he gives us aid. I want you to flip over one page into Hebrews chapter 4. This is a, another writing about Jesus being our priest. I want you to hear this, Hebrews 4.16. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Jesus rescues us in our temptation. Jesus gives us mercy and grace when we need it, which is all the time. He gives it to us freely, openly. And he offers us access to the throne of grace. I want you to hear this wonderful truth. You are not shut out from God's presence. You're not cut off from the throne of grace. You're not far from healing and restoration. It's always one step away. He says that he gives us access with confidence to approach the throne of grace. It's because he demonstrated his love. So here's how I want to end today. I've asked you to pay attention to certain things because I don't want you to drift. And maybe as you've been paying attention to these things, you've recognized that you have drift, drifted. Here's the beautiful thing about what happens today. If you recognize that you've drifted, you can come back. You've never gone too far. You've never done too much. You can come back. It's time to turn. Turn and come home. Pay attention to this. God loves you. 
God cares about you, and Jesus died for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, we praise you, and we love you. We ask now that you would speak to our hearts. Help us, help us to experience this and, and really grab onto the fact and pay close attention to what you've done, to what you are doing, to what you will do in our life if we let you. God, give us grace and boldness to say yes. Step out in faith and say yes. To come home, to be saved, to be changed from the inside out, to respond in faith to what you're asking us to do. God, we ask that you would do that now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.